I would like to say something about the background she came from. Yes. Uh, that you know, she was not a privileged person. She was born in Bristol in a house in Counterslip. That house is now gone. Her father was a sugar refiner. Uh, he was also um, a very liberal man. We have the American postage stamp commemorating her. And here we have the latest um, unveiling in America. This is in the grounds of her college, and it's a rather beautiful sculpture of her, which was um, done in 1994. I came across a letter that had been written to the local newspaper in 1923, and it was a woman who uh, was a resident of Bristol, but she'd been on holiday in Scotland and had wandered into a churchyard and there she found a Celtic cross, and on it was an inscription saying to the memory of Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman doctor, born in Bristol. And immediately I thought, well, why hasn't she been recognised? Um, well, these are various press cuttings showing attempts by people to bring Elizabeth Blackwell into more prominence. Little Shy, the Bristol girl who became world famous. Although she was squeamish. Yes, yes, I think she, funny enough, she couldn't bear the thought of blood. <laughs> That's why you know, becoming a doctor was even more remarkable. But she never really felt medicine as a calling. It was the equality thing. That's what it was. You know, proving something, really. I think Elizabeth Blackwell wanted to reform the world. Uh, she worked uh, for the abolition of slavery, uh, the equality of the sexes. It was suggested to her several times that she ought to dress as a man to get into medical college, but she rejected that idea because she said she wanted to qualify openly on the same terms as a man and be recognised as a woman doctor. This is after um, Elizabeth Blackwell opened the profession to women, probably about 1870, I think, and it shows women dissecting and women um, having lectures and being given their degrees. And of course, they're all still in very formal dress of the time. She's very well known for one phrase. She said, every child has the right to be well-born, well-educated and well-nourished. I think she introduced the notion of well-being into medicine and this is where the Institute is carrying on with her work. When asked what life would be like for women of the future, in a hundred years time women will not be as they are now. She didn't say for better or worse. Yes. Things <laughs> would be different, yes. <laughs> Just different. <laughs> She was always a nonconformist, but she darted all over the place with religion. She moved from one to the other. Uh, she was a Christian socialist, really, towards the end of her life, I think. And pr probably came across Methodists and other form, you know. In oh, yeah, she mixed with, um, oh, you'll find if you read the book, that she had what she called was the, the breakfast of all the religions down at the bottom in the hotel at the bottom of Park Street. And um, she had a... I think it was a Hindu and uh, a Quaker and uh, an atheist and the lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would like to say something about the background she came from, yes. uh, that you know, she was not a privileged person. She was born in Bristol in a house in Counterslip. That house is now gone. Her mother came from a very old Bristol family who were goldsmiths and jewellers. Her father was a sugar refiner. And the first panel is her home in Wilson Street, um, where she spent about four years of her life, we think, where the lamp is here. In her memoir, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell talks about the walks that the family took with the governess. And one of the walks that she was very fond of was um, to go to see Mother Pugsley's well. It, the tradition was it was a healing well in Kingsdown. It's now all built over, of course. And it also depicts the membership of the Anti-Slavery Society, gives a list of the members, including Samuel Blackwell, her father, who was a founding member. 
and the children themselves were imbued with the idea of equality, equality of everyone, regardless of colour or creed. And they actually, when they were small, they gave up having sugar in their tea because they thought that would be a demonstration of what they believed in. So he had nine children and they, uh, three girls were educated in the same way as their brothers. So they had access to books at home and they had a very wide reading and her fa the father was seemed to be a very tolerant and interested father. And he also treated his wife with great respect, which not all Victorian husbands did. They emigrated to America when Elizabeth was 11 years old. The reasons they emigrated were quite complex. There were social reasons. Bristol um, had the riots, of course, the 1831 riots, and her father um, was uh, intimately involved there in trying to defend uh, the uh, cathedral. Um, it was also cholera raging in the city. The family was nonconformist. They were uh, congregationalists, and that meant, of course, that the uh, sons were denied entry to the universities and to the professions. So the openings in Bristol for a family and family of great intelligence and, and well read were not great. So what probably was the um, deciding factor was that he knew other people friends who had gone to America and they were corresponding with him saying this is a great country, it, there's equality here, it's a chance for all, why don't you come and set up here? And that's how they went to America. They shut up the house they were living in and took a house in Hot Wells for a short time so they'd be near the docks for embarkation. This shows you a ship very like the one that uh, the Blackwell family sailed to America in. And there were 15 Blackwells who went in these very crowded conditions because the family, at that time there were eight children, the parents, four maiden aunts and the governess. And that was in 1831 and it was a very crowded ship. The voyage took eight weeks and a lot of the people on board were ill, some of them had cholera, and Elizabeth's older sister described it as a floating hell. When they got there, at first all went very well, they were quite comfortable, but then trade declined in the sugar industry. Um, Samuel was trying to pioneer a, a movement to refine sugar from beet instead of the slave-picked cane sugar. But so uh, he had difficulties there. And then there were various fires in the city at the sugar refineries and he couldn't get insurance. So he was sitting up all night guarding the machinery in his factory. And that took a toll on his health. And at the age of 48, he caught a fever and he died. And he left his wife and nine children in debt and entirely unprovided for. So at that time, they were in complete poverty. They could see no way out of it. However, the girls, Elizabeth at that time was 17 and she had two old sisters and they were all well read. Elizabeth could read German and French and she was an accomplished musician. So they set up a school in their home and they took in boarders and worked there for four years teaching although all of them disliked teaching, and Elizabeth hated it. So they did that until their brothers were able to go out and get work, and then the girls could give up the teaching. But Elizabeth knew that she wanted a career. She didn't know what she wanted, and she wanted a career that would give her a hard challenge. So that's really how she came into medicine. The, a friend of hers, was suffering from uterine cancer. And she said she thought she would have suffered less if only she'd been able to have a woman doctor. And said to Elizabeth, why don't you uh, go into medicine? You have the health and the intelligence. And Elizabeth at first recoiled from the idea because she felt she was too squeamish. 
And she also didn't know how she would do it. She'd had various medical friends, and they all said, what a wonderful idea, but it's quite impossible. So, of course, she knew she'd found her hard challenge. She was a very, very determined woman. She took another hated teaching job. She boarded in the house of a sympathetic doctor, and this doctor undertook to give her lessons in anatomy and physiology. So her working day was something like getting up in the morning when she would uh, study Greek and Latin, which she also needed for entrance into medical college. She would then teach during the day. She would then study anatomy and physiology in the evening. And she lived very frugally. And in that way, she was able to save enough money for entry into medical college. But then, of course, came the challenge of being accepted. Uh, she applied to 16 medical colleges and all refused her. Then she was recommended by one of these eminent doctors she knew to apply to Geneva College. It's quite a small medical college. And the dean, um, when he received her application, wanted to refuse it. But he also didn't want to offend the eminent man who had recommended her. So he turned over the decision to the student body. And they, thinking it a joke, voted to admit her. So she turned up to a class 150 men and just her. And this is a picture of the college, Geneva College, that finally admitted her, even if it was by a fluke. You could imagine 18 year old boys throwing paper darts and things. Oh God, the ragging, yes. Whatever, <laughs> yeah. Whatever but, you know, eventually they said she was, her brother went to her graduation and he talked to some of the students and they all said, oh, she was great, you know. So she obviously uh, became one of them. She got on very well with most of the students. The townspeople were highly suspicious of her. They thought she must be either mad or bad to want to do such a thing. But she worked very hard while she was there, and at the end of her course, uh, she passed a top of the class in all subjects, and the thesis she wrote on typhus was later published. But she realised, of course, that she needed further qualification. So she thought what she would really want to do is obstetric surgery. And she applied to various colleges for that, but again, they would admit her. She eventually went to Paris, where she went to a, a hospital for midwives at her training school. So she actually, although she was a qualified doctor, she went back as a student. We're now showing the La Maternité in Paris, where she went to with the hope of becoming an obstetric surgeon. But it was there that she had a very bitter disappointment because she was late one night, she was called up to administer a solution into the infected eye of a baby. And while she was doing that, part of the infected solution squirted into her own eye. And as a consequence, she lost the sight of her eye and eventually the eye itself. It also meant that she had to give up all hope of becoming a surgeon. It was a very, very difficult time for her. She nearly gave up, but she said, I, I've come so far now, I can't. So she applied to uh, England, and she went to have a year of studying, postgraduate study, on the wards in St. Bartholomew's. The only one that was unwilling to take her was the gynecological ward, which seems very strange, but uh, that was the, uh, the temper of the time. Um, she was very tempted to stay in England at that point, but she knew she couldn't. She had work to do in America, and of course she still had no money. So she went back to New York. And again, she had a disappointment because she thought she'd opened the medical profession to women. When she, she graduated, there was great acclaim, both in America and in England, of this great doctor, she was called Doctrix Blackwell. And everyone thought it was the most wonderful achievement for a woman to have done it. But what she had thought had happened was that she'd opened the medical profession to women. 
But these people who had praised her so much really thought she was just an exceptional woman, that she had done something that nobody else had done or who probably would never do. So it was done and that was it and we would celebrate it and then close that chapter. So she tried to set up in practice in New York and she struggled until some Quaker women uh, uh, supported her and she opened a dispensary for poor women and children. But she struggled to get patients, people didn't trust her, a woman doctor, and she had a very hard time until she was supported by some Quaker women who put the word around and gave her a lot of encouragement. But she still had a terribly hard time. When she went out on night calls, she was followed and harassed in the street. If a patient died, she was accused of killing the patient, and on occasions her hospital was stoned. She said at that time, it is too hard. I know why this life has never been lived before. It's too hard to work against every form of social opposition. She said rather plaintively, I would like a little fun now and then. But fun was in very short supply. But her sister Emily was also trying to get into medical school. And eventually she did. So the two sisters worked together. They then opened a hospital in New York, the Hospital for Women and Children. And this is a picture on the left of the hospital itself. But she still hadn't uh, finished she came to England in 1859 where she was urged to put her name on the British Medical Register. She was the first woman to do so. She was urged to do so by uh, people who wanted a medical education for women in England too. So she took that opportunity and had her name entered on it. And there were people who were determined she'd be the last because the register was then closed to any woman who hadn't qualified in Britain. And of course, there were no medical schools in Britain. So she remembered this and thought she would try to do something about it when she could. But she went back to New York to fulfill another ambition. And this was to make sure that women could get into medical college more easily. She'd always been very much against having separate education for women because she thought it would be regarded as inferior to that of men. But she thought needs must. It was so difficult to get into college that she set up her own college in her hospital. And there she established very high standards, had external examiners and gained a very good reputation. Just as an indication of the attitude of some in the medical profession um, to women being educated, and especially women going into medicine, one of them said, the promiscuous intermingling of the sexes in our schools I utterly repudiate. I say, let her stay at home and put on an apron and attend to her children. I fear hopeless insanity brought on by brain overwork at school. Four of my cases, this is a doctor writing, four of my cases of very bad nervous exhaustion were graduates of our best known female colleges. This was written after some female colleges had opened in America. They always wrap it up in, um, we're, just, we're just trying to help her. Yes, yes, you know, good uh, enough for her. Yes, it's <laughs> wonderful, isn't it? You can understand how indignant she was over it. <laughs> This is after um, Elizabeth Blackwell opened the profession to women. So you had a college district, probably about 1870, I think, and it shows women dissecting and women um, having lectures and being given their degrees. And of course, they're all still in very formal dress of the time. We're now entering a new period in her life when she comes to England and settles here for the rest of her life. It's 1869, she leaves America. She set up in private practice in London and she went around the country giving lectures and encouraging young British women 
to do what she had done. She wasn't a suffragette, and she didn't pioneer the votes for women, anything like that, because uh, some of the women who were doing it were quite anti-men. Not all of them, but some of them were. And she said, I've had too much kindness from men to be anti-men. Because she, there had been, although uh, there was a lot of hostility, uh, she had had encouragement from some very good men. She became friends with Florence Nightingale on one of her visits um, to England. Um, but they were two very strong-minded women together and didn't always agree because uh, Florence Nightingale saw women's future in medicine as nurses, whereas Elizabeth Blackwell saw them as doctors on equal terms with men. And, um, but she was always very grateful to Florence Nightingale for raising her awareness of the importance of sanitation. And she always incorporated sanitation and hygiene. It came very high on her list of prevention of disease. Yeah, she came back to Bristol in um, 1869. Uh, she then took the opportunity of revisiting the home she'd grown up in, in Wilson Street. And she was shown around by the people who lived there. And it brought a lot of memories rushing back to her. She remembered her father coming in from the sugar refinery in his white overalls. And the time that the children, uh, she, she and her sisters and brothers, had spent playing in the gardens there. And then she came back again to Bristol in the uh, beginning of the um, 20th century when she brought her adopted daughter with her and walked around the places that, again, she wanted to show her, doctor, her daughter where she had played as a child. But she concluded at that time that Bristol had changed out of all recognition. I want to go to 1871, I'm still, I'm in the time she's in England now, and talking about what she was doing in, uh, that she was working, she had a private practice, she had the chair of gynaecology at the uh, women's hospital, and then in 1871 she gathered a group of like-minded people around her, and they founded the NHS which was the National Health Society. It had a motto, prevention is better than cure. She set up a series of lectures called the Penny Lectures so that they were so cheap that anyone could afford to go. She had engaged a number of lecturers to come and talk about um, first aid, about sanitation, the importance of diet and hygiene. Um, among her listeners at one of her lectures was Elizabeth Garrett, later Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, and she was encouraged to pursue her path into medicine, which was a, another difficult one, but not quite as difficult as Elizabeth Blackwell. And eventually, um, in the 1870s, women um, were allowed into medical colleges in England. When uh, the Hospital for Women was opened in London, she took the chair of gynaecology. And she also, at that time, with the help of other people, pioneered the training of health visitors. And that continued until it was taken over in 1948 at the founding of the National Health Service, the new NHS. The new NHS, yes. Yeah. She'd been, been given very little credit for that, actually. But her own health was not good. And eventually she had to give up private practice. And she really wanted to spend the rest of her life, now that she'd opened the medical profession safely and securely, she wanted to do other things. So she continued her writings, many publications, she worked for um, anti-vivisection, she worked with sex education for girls, um, she also worked prison reform, the cooperative movement. She had a wide, wide range of interests. I mean, we're coming pretty well to the end of her life. I mean, she died, oh, in uh, 1910. She was aged 89. 
This um, picture shows her as an old woman in her last home in Hastings. She went there to get away from London, really. It's not entirely clear what was wrong with her, but it was some form of colic. It was a chronic illness, and it prevented her from working full-time in medicine. And she decided that Hastings, with the fresh air of Hastings and being by the sea, would be preferable to remaining in London. So she moved there, and she spent the rest of her life living there. Hastings Local History Society have put a plaque on the house. Um, her later life really was devoted to writings on a number of subjects. She was an outspoken op opponent of vivisection. She also wrote on sex education. She thought uh, girls in particular should be educated and uh, she was particularly anxious about children's lives. She said um, they should be well-born well-nourished and well-educated. She not only went to America, but she used to go to um, Italy very frequently because she went to Paris. People did travel a lot in mm. the previous century, and even in the Middle Ages, you know, more than we thought. Scotland, of course, she was very fond of, and you know, she mm. did a lot of travelling, really. This one shows the hotel in um, Scotland, in Kilmun, which is near Holy Loch. Uh, she and her adopted daughter spent the, uh, many summers there, and she had very happy memories of it, and requested that she be buried there. So this is the rather lovely Celtic cross um, that is in her name, and um, commemorates her, and um, it is well cared for by women uh, doctors um, from Glasgow who tend it on her birthday and the anniversary of her death. At the end of my booklet on her, um, I, somebody says, um, when in 1895 um, the woman doctor, the protégé of Elizabeth Blackwell, visited Westminster Abbey, she looked at the memorials to the famous people there. And she said, will there ever be a monument to the first woman physician? Because she was the leader of the movement because she had the energy, the will and the talent, and because she's a landmark of an era of women's freeing themselves from the bondage of prejudice and from the belief that they are the lower being when compared with men. We cannot afford to forget her. There was a very long obituary notice in the, um, in the Times when she died, and whatever it did. So she was recognised at the time? When she died, yes, I think, that, well, as I said, there's this very... Um, but it was intermittent, you know, people would suddenly discover her and then write a letter to the newspaper or an article and then she was forgotten again. <laughs> We're hoping next year uh, a book will be published in America, written by an American, um, who shares my interest and it's going to be called Doctor Sisters, and it's going to be the story of Elizabeth Blackwell and her younger sister Emily, who um, opened a hospital in New York together. When I went into the record office, I think I had something of a reputation of um, being a patron of lost causes because I tended to find rather uh, obscure people or people who hadn't been recognised in Bristol. Right. Bristol girl fought strong prejudice to become the first woman doctor. And this was written in the 1950s. Little Shy, the Bristol girl who became world famous. And then another letter to the press. Um, this is in 1950s again, headed Remarkable Woman. But none of them had any outcome until the plaque was erected on her house and the Medical Women's Federation took up the cause. I contacted the Medical Women's Federation, which she had founded under a different name, and asked them if they would be interested in subscribing to a plaque 
Well, that was very fortunate because they were arranging their annual general meeting, which was to be held in Bristol the following year. So they immediately took up the idea and they raised all the money for the plaque themselves and they made it the um, focal point of their meeting in Bristol that year. Dr. Ber Corner, she's very famous in Bristol. She was um, a very good um, neonatal doctor. That's Beryl Corner, and that is the youngest medical student who was born in Bristol. And this is the president of the um, Me Medical Women's Federation. And then uh, that is me. <laughs> And now, of course, you find there's that mug of famous Bristolian. She's even on that with Banksy, you know. You got, and, and then I got some guy from um, ITV, and he introduced the news uh, on the TV by saying, oh, Brunel, Banksy, and now Blackwell, you know. <laughs> I thought, oh, dear. <laughs> I think, I think a, a scholarship in her name would be the most valuable thing. I think that's what she would have wanted. Um, there is the possible talk of a statue to her, which may come about, um, but I try to think what she herself would have wanted. She was a very self-effacing woman, and she was so anxious to pioneer medicine as a, a career for women that I, I think something lasting like that would be very appropriate. And of course the great thing is these lectures every year at the, um, uh, at the university are um, paid for by the Blackwell family, mm. which is very generous. You know. And it, they're always, the lectures are always given by a woman in medicine. Yes. Which yeah. is good. I think she would have greatly approved of the founding of the Institute being in her name. Um, because it's carrying on the work that she started, really. She was a pioneer. The Institute is doing pioneering work. In her time, the word interdisciplinary was not fashionable, but she uh, understood the spirit of it. And because her own interest was so wide in people's well-being and that you should give, give people good homes to live in, um, teach them to cooperate with the professionals in caring for their own health and so on. All this is being carried on in the work of the Institute.